اصحاب الاستاذ الدكتور عصام بليغ انهم شرفنا النهارده في الجورنال كلاب واحنا المره اللي فاتت قلنا يعني عن كفر الفور جايد لاينز اللي هي 2021 والمره اللي فاتت كان الكارديك بيسنج جايد لاينز النهارده يعني ان شاء الله هيبقى الهارت فيل جايد لاينز وطبعا الدكتوره ميري عاطف هي يعني شي از وان اوف ذا يعني تيم اللي شغال في الهارت فيلير ويعني عامله مجهود كبير في الهارت فيلير جروب الفتره اللي فاتت فالنهارده ان شاء الله نسعد بالبرزنتيشن بتاعها ان شاء الله من غير تاخير بقى يعني ان شاء الله نبتدي بقى دلوقتي على طول دكتوره ميري اتفضل ثانك يو دكتور ماجدي Sorry, technical error. Uh, good afternoon, my dear professors and colleagues. I'm honored to be invited by Dr. Magdi to present today's journal club, the Heart Failure Guidelines 2021. Our main focus will be from the European guidelines, but we will mention some points from the American guidelines along the way. This is our index. We'll talk about the definition, the classification, prevention, chronic, acute, and advanced heart failure entities, and the comorbidities. Regarding the definition of heart failure, the 2021 ESC guidelines did not change much from the 2016. You have to have the, the clinical syndrome of heart failure with the symptoms and signs. And then according to the ejection fraction, you either have half ref, half ref, or mildly reduced ejection fraction. The term uh, mid-range ejection fraction was changed to mildly reduced, reflecting the association, the close the similarity between the, mid -range, um, the mildly reduced ejection fraction and half ref For half path you need to have the clinical syndrome of heart failure, ejection fraction more than 50, and objective evidence of cardiac structural or functional abnormalities. half path is a probable diagnosis, uh, which means like if you have more findings, the more findings you have, the more likelihood this patient has half path The American guidelines went further. Oh, sorry. The American guidelines went further uh, and added a new category of heart failure, which is heart failure with improved ejection fraction. This is a heart failure with baseline ejection fraction of less than 40. And then the patient has a 10 point increase from baseline and a second measurement of more than 40%. The terminology is important because for example, a patient with heart failure with improved ejection fraction, for example, if the ejection fraction uh, is improved up to 51%, should not be dealt with as half path it should still be dealt with as heart failure with improved ejection fraction with the same treatment of half ref Regarding the prevention of the syndrome of clinical heart failure, obviously we have to, it's a class one recommendation to treat the risk factor, treating hypertension, treating with statins in patients with cardiovascular disease, sodium glucose liminal transporters in patients with diabetes at high risk, and counseling against the bad habits of sedentary lifestyle, obesity, and cigarette smoking. Now moving on to chronic heart failure, we will talk about the diagnostic algorithm. When you have a patient suspected of, with, uh, with suspicious signs of, symptoms and signs of heart failure, you proceed to do the BNP levels. BNP can rule in and rule out the heart failure. If the BNPs are not available, we proceed, and anyway, we proceed to echocardiography to categorize this patient as half ref, half ref, or heart failure might be reduced ejection fraction. Regarding the etiology of chronic heart failure, there is a long list of causes in the guidelines. I encourage you to review it. Let me just remind you that there are some uh, rare causes or rather uncommon causes like endomyocardial disease, endomyocardial fibrosis, storage disorders as hemochromatosis, uh, infiltrative disorders right, like amyloidosis. In some specific patients uh, in, with heart failure, we will do some selected investigations. Not every heart, pa heart failure patient, of course. For example, the CMR, as you all know, and this is not a new recommendation, is a class one if the patient has poor ecogenic window and class one for tissue char characterization in suspected infiltrative diseases. The CMR is also a class 2A recommendation to distinguish between ischemic and non-ischemic myocardial damage in dilated cardiomyopathy. The cardiopulmonary exercise testing uh, is a class 2A recommendation to optimize prescription of, of exercise training and to identify unexplained dyspnea or exercise intolerance, the 2021 ESC guidelines emphasize the importance of exercise for heart failure patients. So what about coronary angio non-invasive testing? 
Coronary angio is definitely class one in patients with angina despite optimal medical therapy or symptomatic ventricular arrhythmia. However, it was downgraded in patients with heart failure and intermediate to high pretest probability of coronary artery disease. It's now a class 2B recommendation. If the patient has heart failure and low to intermediate pretest probability, the, T the CT coronary angio was upgraded to class 2A. The other non invasive stress imaging, as CMR stress echo or exercise testing, are now class 2B recommendations. So, what about right heart cath in a heart failure patient? Of course, if the, if, it's, uh, if the patient is indicated for heart transplantation. However, there is a new recommendation, a class 2A recommendation, if the patient has heart failure, which is suspected due to constrictive pericarditis, restrictive congenital heart disease, and high output states. It's a class 2A, of course, if we have suspicious of pulmonary hypertension. And it's a class 2B in some patients with have path to confirm the diagnosis. The endomyocardium biopsy, as you all know, should be done if there is a pr probability of a specific diagnosis, which can be confirmed only by myocardial biopsy, like endomyocardial fibrosis, for example. So what about the medical treatment of chronic heart failure? We now have a chronic heart failure patient, which is a very common scenario we encounter in everyday outpatient clinic. So the guidelines, the ESC guidelines, summarize the treatment recommendation to class one recommendations. We have to ensure that the patient is on optimal maximum tolerated dose of class one drugs. And then if the patient is still symptomatic, he, he goes into one of two pathway, either device therapy, device therapy or uh, if he's not indicated for device therapy, he should go for class two drugs. The class one drugs, as you all know, is ACE slash ARNI. The ESC guidelines upgraded the sacubitril vazartan to be um, in the 2016 guidelines, it was used after the patient used ACE and was still symptomatic. Now it's a class one to start with ARNI, and the American guidelines went further and said that the starting the treatment with sacobitril buzzartan is preferred over starting with ACE. We have the beta blocker, mineralocorticoid antagonist, sodium glucose liminal transporters, specifically DAPA and impagliflozin, loop diuretics. We will stop here for a couple of minutes to discuss the signs which caused the shift in this class one drugs. So I tried to summarize for you the major trials in the sacubitril vazartan. As in any drug, uh, when it's uh, when we try when we start using a drug, we we start with trials which establish the safety and the efficacy of the drug. We had the paradigm heart failure, of course, which was Arnie versus Inalapril in ambulatory heart failure patients. The titration, which was a safety uh, trial to to safety to reach the tolerability, uh, the target doses of the sacubitril vazartan. We have the transition, which was very important because it was the first trial to start um, RNA after stabilization of acute heart failure episode in hospital or shortly after discharge. The pioneer was extremely important because a large group of patients, 50% were ACE naive patients. All of these drugs showed that RNA had a favorable effect reduced the cardiovascular uh, death, heart hospitalization, the primary and secondary endpoints. Then they moved on to, to try to study how the sacubitril vazartan benefits the heart, like uh, the pathophysiological mechanism. So we have the proof heart failure and the evaluate trial. Both trials showed that there is reverse cardiac remodeling with the sacubitril vazartan with decrease in LV volumes and improved ejection fraction. This has a clinical application. For example, if a patient is indicated for ICD and he has started with treatment of sacubitril vazartan, his ejection fraction can improve and he gets no longer indicated for ICD. Then we have uh, trials for in specific situations like post-MI, paradise MI, which unfortunately uh, the, the primary endpoint was less uh, with only but not statistically significant. And the prime, which showed that sacubitril vazartan de decreased functional mitral regurgitation decrease the regurgitant volume and decrease the effective regurgitant orifice area. On a side note, uh, you will find always that uh, most of the trials of heart failure, they, uh, they uh, monitor the, uh, most of the trials of sacubitril buzzartan, they monitor using the NT pro BNP instead of the BNP, uh, because the BNP is, as, uh, is a substrate for the nepri lysin pathway. So uh, on starting treatment with sacubitril buzzartan, there is usually uh, early modest increase in BNPs despite improvement in the heart failure profile of the patient. So what about sodium glucose liminal transporters? We have the DAPA heart failure, of course, DAPA glefluzin versus placebo. Left, uh, the patients which with, uh, were included with ejection fraction less than 40, GFR more than, more than 30, 
it resulted in a decrease in the primary endpoint of cardiovascular death hospitalization. Dapagliflozin uh, has a favorable primary outcome, a secondary outcome, and the results were independent of diabetes or hemoglobin E1C values. Then we had the MPRO reduced, which were empagliflozin versus placebo. This trial included patients with more advanced heart failure. The mean ejection fraction was 27%. It had a more worse uh, patients with uh, patients with more worse uh, renal profile, like GFR was more than 20. Again, the results were independent of the presence or absence of diabetes. It decreased the primary outcome of cardiovascular deaths and first and recurrent hospitalization. Moreover, it showed that there is a reduction in the composite renal outcome. There was a reduction in the incidence of chronic dialysis, renal transplantation, and sustained decrease in the GFR. So now after we ensured that our patient is on maximum tolerated dose of the class one drugs and he is still symptomatic, not indicated for device, device therapy, we move on to class two uh, drugs. These are relatively old drugs, you all know it. We start, we use Ivabradine in patients with uh, on maximum, uh, maximum evidence-based doses with still uh, tachycardia more than 70 beats per minute or who are unable to tolerate beta blockers. This is a class two A recommendation. We use digoxin and hydralazine uh, isotropide nitrate as a class 2B recommendations in patients still on optimal medical therapy and still symptomatic. There is a new class 2 drug which was introduced in these ESC guidelines, the Verisigweight. Verisigweight is a soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator which acts independently of nitric oxide. What, this, what does this mean? Interestingly, uh, in, the, in the pathway, uh, causing heart failure, there is, a, there is a pathway called the nitric oxide GMP phosphodiesterase pathway. As you move down along this pathway, you have more favorable prognosis on the heart, blood vessels, and the kidney. For example, as you move down this pathway, there is less hypertrophy, less fibrosis in the heart, less fibrosis in the kidney, less inflammation in the blood vessels. This pathway starts with uh, nitric oxide acting on GTP, cyclic GMP, and then acts on the heart blood vessels and the kidney. So we have the nitrates, uh, which is a very old drug, uh, to generate nitric oxide. We have the secobitril valsartan, which is an eprilysin inhibitor and increase the, uh, uh, increase the natural uretic peptides, which acts also through this pathway. And we have the new drugs, the very weight, which acts independently of nitric oxide to stimulate the cyclic GMP and go down along this pathway. So according to the Victoria trial, which used basic weight 10 milligram once versus placebo in patients with impaired ejection fraction already on optimal medical therapy and showed a modest 10% uh, decrease in cardiovascular deaths and first hospitalization. According to this data, the ESC guidelines put very weight as a class 2B recommendation in patients with worsening heart failure despite treatment with optimal medical therapy. What about device therapy? Uh, we reviewed the device uh, therapy thoroughly in the last journal club. We all know that the ICD is a class one if the patient uh, recovered from a ventricular arrhythmia as a secondary prevention, and is a class one in patient uh, ischemic patient as a primary prevention if he has symptomatic heart failure, rejection fraction less than 35, with more than three months of optimal medical therapy, as we mentioned, because some patients have improved ejection fraction with treatment. It's a class 2A in non-ischemic etiology, and this was downgraded from the 2016 guidelines. It was downgraded from class 1 to class 2A. Let me remind you that ICD is not recommended within 40 days of MI and is not recommended in patients uh, with severe symptoms refractory to pharmacological therapy. As for the CRT, CRT is a class 1, of course, for patients with left bundle and QRS more than 150 with impaired ejection fraction less than 35 is a class one regardless of the QRS or the NIHA class if the patient is already indicated for ventricular pacing. Is a class two if the patient has wide QRS more than 150 but none left bundle. And was a class two if the patient has left bundle but not very wide QRS, 130 to 149. This was uh, downgraded from the 2016 guidelines. And it's a class two A uh, in patients who have received a conventional pacemaker or an ICD who develop worsening heart failure as an upgrade to CRT. This was upgraded. CRT is a class 2B if the patient is non-left bundle and uh, QRS not very wide from 130 to 149 and is contraindicated or not recommended in QRS duration less than 130. 
This is a nice algorithm proposed by the ESC guidelines uh, explaining the, uh, the treatment according to the phenotype of each patient. So uh, all patients should uh, take the mortality, mortality benefit drugs, the four drugs, and then the, he, they should take diuretics. And according to each scenario, for example, AF should receive the anticoagulation, possibly rate control or rhythm control. Iron deficiency, as we will mention later on, should receive the ferric carboxymal dose. Uh, I'll tell some clinical points in daily practice for my younger colleagues, uh, which one to start, uh, beta blocker or ARNI or ACE. Uh, the American guidelines state that you can either start with one of them or both of them. Generally, beta blocker is well tolerated if the patient is more on the dry side, and ACE or ARNI uh, should be started if the patient is more on the congested side. Up titration of doses as an outpatient should occur every two weeks, not sooner. If you start your patient on RAS blockers, ARNI or mineralocorticoid antagonist, you should do renal function tests and electrolytes one to two weeks after start or dose titration, then every four months. Remind your patient to avoid over-the-counter non-steroidals. When switching from ACE to ARNI, of course, you all know the wash out 36 hours. And if the patient was already on uh, 10 milligram or less inalapril or 160 milligram or less Valsartan, you should start with a lower dose than usual, 24, 26 BID and up titrate again every two weeks, not sooner. We use only the beta blockers of proven benefit in heart failure, the mesoprolol, carbidolol, and metoprolol succinate, also the nebivolol. Nebivolol is approved in the European, but not in the American. If you, try, if you are using cruzamide uh, more than 80 milligram BID, you should switch to another loop or use com com combination like metolazone, for example. Regarding the sodium glucose general transporter 2 inhibitors, as you have seen, it's a breakthrough. Uh, it's query whether we should use it in type 1 diabetes or not. The European guidelines say that you can use it, but cautiously because it increased the risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. The American guidelines said that, uh, said that they are contraindicated in type 1 diabetes. Now, moving on to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We said it's, the patient should have the clinical syndrome of heart failure ejection fraction more than 40, with evidence of structural or functional abnormalities. The greater the number of abnormalities, the higher the likelihood that this patient has HFF. The abnormalities are echo findings and BNP findings. These echo findings are, can be easily calculated from the routine, uh, routine uh, measurements we do in everyday practice. What about the treatment recommendations in HFPEF? The 2021 ESC guidelines said that none of the large randomized control trials in HFPEF had achieved their primary endpoints. This includes all the guideline-based uh, therapies, pyronolactone, candizartan, secobitril, valsartan, digoxin, and recommended screening for and treatment of etiologies as a class one and diuretics as a class one for symptomatic relief. However, we will have to say here that after the guidelines were published, the Emperor Preserved 2021 was published in October 2021. This study studied impact flows in 10 milligram mass versus placebo in patients with ejection fraction more than 40, GFR more than 20. Again, the results were independent of diabetes. It showed a strikingly um, reduction in the composite endpoint of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. This, uh, these results were achieved has achieved statistical significance from day 18. Very early on the trial, the patient uh, showed benefit from impact liprosin. Also, it reduced, reduced the secondary endpoints of total heart failure hospitalizations. This trial is extremely important because now impact liprosin is by far the first drug of approved uh, documented benefit in HFPF, which achieved a uh, reduction in primary endpoint with a high statistical significance. Even the secobitry buzzartan significance was marginal, as you can see. But about the heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction, it is the least studied uh, in the trials. The data uh, about heart failure mildly reduced ejection fraction are, um, are almost always derived from post, post hoc analysis, like the, uh, like the emperor preserved, for example. They include patients with heart, heart failure with ejection fraction more than 40. And then they do post hoc analysis to analyze the patients from 40 to 49% ejection fraction. The recommendation is diagnostics as a class one. The ACE, beta blockers, MRA, and secobitril valsartan are class 2B recommendation. Do not forget that we have the impact gliflozin now, 
What about device therapy in half path or half mildly reduced ejection fraction? There is insufficient evidence for ICD or CRT. Let me tell you that there is a new device which is being recently investigated, an interatrial shunt device for the treatment of half path. Uh, the reduce left, left atrial pressure heart failure trial. It's a large trial with, with uh, three phases. Phase three should end by the end of this year. So anyway, this trial uh, included patients with ejection fraction more than 40. It used a transcatheter interatrial shunt device to decrease the left atrial pressure. It resulted in decrease in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure during exercise at one month. Further studies are going on. This is the picture of the device. The guidelines emphasize that the patient should be well-educated about self-management strategies. You should educate your patient about weighing his, uh, his weight every day. If, for example, uh, he gains two kilograms in three days, he should adjust his diuretics or get back to you. Emphasize the importance of clinic-based programs like our heart failure clinic. Added a new recommendation for the influenza pneumococcal vaccination. It's a class 2A to give them to heart failure patients to prevent hospitalization. Emphasize the importance of exercise in all patients with heart failure, even the, more even the patients with more severe disease, frailty, or more comorbidities. That's a new recommendation. Now we are done with the chronic heart failure, and we will move on to the acute heart failure. So this is the ESC proposed diagnostic workup of new onset acute heart failure. We have a patient with suspicious symptoms and signs of acute heart failure. We proceed with the ECG, echocardiography, initial labs should include, apart from the routine labs, uh, troponin, for example, not only to exclude ischemia, but also because it has a prognostic value. Iron status is extremely important. We will mention it later. Specific investigations like procalcitonin, uh, if we suspect uh, pneumonia, for example, Interestingly, uh, there is a new biomarker, the CA125, which is originally a biomarker for ovarian tumors. Uh, it is being recently studied in acute heart failure and renal dysfunction for a CA125 guided intravenous diuretic therapy. They guide the diuretic doses according to the level of CA125, and it showed uh, a better renal performance at 72 uh, at three days and 30 days. Uh, this biomarker is is really nice because it's widely available, it's cheap, it does not, reason, does not need serial testing because it has long half-life and it's recently investigated. You have to do the history and the lung ultrasound, especially if uh, the patient, if the BNPs are not available. Some lung ultrasound techniques are 90% specific. It's easy and the resident can do them at bedside. And then you should do the natriuretic peptides to rule in and rule out heart failure. Now that we have, uh, now that we have uh, established the diagnosis of acute heart failure, the physician in the emergency department should exclude treatable causes. These treatable causes have the mnemonic of CHAMPIT. It was just CHAMP in the 2016 guidelines, and the INT were added in these guidelines. You have to exclude the acute coronary syndrome, hypertensive emergency, arrhythmia, mechanical causes, pulmonary embolism, and they added infections obviously because of the high burden of infection and pneumonia and acute heart failure now, and tamponade. Now that we have diagnosed the acute heart failure and excluded uh, specific treatable causes, we will proceed to the treatment of the syndrome of acute heart failure itself. Acute heart failure presents in one of four forms, acute decompensated heart failure, acute pulmonary edema, cardiogenic shock, and isolated RV failure. Remember that the acute pulmonary edema can present with high blood pressure, and the patient is wet and warm. For the treatment in all these four scenarios, it is class one to give loop diuretics, class one to give oxygen if the patient is hypoxic and not routinely because it causes a widespread vasoconstriction and decrease the cardiac mm -hmm. output. It's a class 2A and you should have a low threshold for ventilatory support if, if your patient is hypoxic and gets respiratory distress with respiratory rate more than 25, you should start non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. It's a class 2B to start uh, to use enotropes and vasopressors as norepinephrine. And the mechanical in patients unresponsive, it's a class 2A to use mechanical circulatory support and renal replacement therapy. All acute heart failure patients should receive thromboembolic prophylaxis as a class 1 recommendation. The routine use of opiates is not recommended. 
this was uh, downgraded from 2B to 3 in these guidelines. Remember that in acute pulmonary edema with systolic blood pressure more than 110, we can use vasodilators as sodium nitroperoxide or nitrates as a class 2B recommendation. It was downgraded based on the galactic trial, which showed no uh, mortality benefit from vas intensive vasodilator versus the usual diuretics. Remember that in cardiogenic shock, you should exclude mechanical complications. And in isolated RV failure, you should exclude pulmonary embolism. You may consider fluid scociously instead of loop diuretics if the patient is not congested. The preferred inotropes are dobutamine as an LV. However, if the patient has pulmonary hypertension secondary to LV dysfunction, it is preferable to use levosimendan or phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Uh, the guidelines proposed a nice algorithm for the um, management of diuretic therapy in patients with acute heart failure. So when you have a patient with acute heart failure, if it's de novo and the patient was not already on oral loop diuretics, you should start with uh, 20 to 40 milligram IV frosamide and then follow hourly, follow the patient hourly for urine output and for your urinary sodium. If there is no response, you should double the dose until you reach the maximum IV dose, which is 400 to 600 milligram. If there's still no response, consider combination diuretic therapies as metulazone or sadide diuretics as a class 2A recommendation. If the patient was already on oral loop diuretics, switch the oral to IV and double the dose. The same dose or double the dose one to two times daily. Again, follow up the patient every hour for the urinary sodium and urinary output. The patient is responding, then it's the same dose to be given twice daily. If it's not re responding, double it dose or use combination diuretic therapy. Uh, these, are, these were the recommendations for the use of short-term mechanical circulatory support in patients with cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock was reviewed thoroughly two days ago by Dr. Mina. Short-term mechanical circulatory support should be considered in patients with cardiogenic shock as a class 2A recommendation as a bridge to therapy or bridge to decision, bridge to recovery. The routine use of intraortic balloon is not recommended. It's a class 2B recommendation as a bridge as well. Um, these are the recommendations emphasized by the guidelines for the pre-discharge and early post-discharge follow-up. Do not uh, discharge your patient except after you exclude persistent signs of congestion, which is a common mistake. Uh, the patient should start the evidence-based oral medical treatment prior to discharge. An early follow-up visit just after one to two weeks after discharge is a class one recommendation. Ferric carboxymaltose should be considered for iron deficiency, defined as serum ferritin less than 100, or between 100 and 299 with T-sat less than 20% to improve symptoms. It's the class 2A recommendation. Now we will move on to the new clinical entity of advanced heart failure, the new ESC guidelines describe advanced heart failure as a distinct clinical entity. They no longer use the terminology of uh, end-stage heart failure or terminal heart failure or so on. They put uh, a definition for advanced heart failure with criteria to describe it. These criteria are that, that, the, that the patient should be on optimal medical therapy and have all of the following criteria, severe and persistent symptoms, severe LV dysfunction or severe RV dysfunction or valve abnormalities or persistently high BNP values, one of these four, and episodes of pulmonary or systemic congestion uh, or episodes of low output requiring enotropes, severe impairment of exercise capacity with inability to exercise or low six minute walk test. If the patient had these four criteria, then we the new patient is an advanced heart failure patient and should be treated and dealt with accordingly. The guidelines proposed uh, a treatment algorithm for the advanced heart failure patients based on the Intermax profile. These are uh, profile classification according to the mechanical circulatory device, uh, mechanical circulatory support from one to seven, one to four being the worst critical cardiogenic shock, two is sliding, three is enotrope dependent, four is frequent flyer, five is housebound, exer six exertion limited, and seven is advanced NIHA class three symptoms. If the patient has one of the bad profiles from Intermax 1 to Intermax 4, it's a class 2A to give short-term mechanical circulatory support uh, until the patient improves and gets weaned from the support, or the patient goes on for an indication to heart transplantation or LVET. 
if the patient is an intermax uh, from five or six or seven, he is a high risk patient should be uh, enlisted in the heart transplantation list or the LVAD if he gets worse with time. Regarding the recommendations for the treatment of patients with advanced heart failure, heart transplantation is a new recommendation. The only indication is that the patient has advanced heart failure by the definition already stated and do not have a contraindication to heart, to heart transplantation. Long-term mechanical circulatory support was upgraded. It now should be considered in patients with advanced half ref despite optimal medical and device therapy who are not eligible for heart transplantation to reduce the risk of death and improve symptoms. And it was upgraded also as a bridge to cardiac transplantation to improve symptoms, decrease hospitalization, and the risk of premature death. In the patient unresponsive with advanced heart failure, we can use the renal replacement therapy as a class 2A recommendation. Enotropes and vasopressors, as we mentioned in acute heart failure, are class 2B recommendation. Ultrafiltration may be considered in refractory volume overload as a class 2B recommendation. Now, our last uh, point is the comorbidities associated with heart failure. Management of atrial fibrillation in patients with heart failure. It's a very common scenario for, of course, um, the, the patient with AF and heart failure should receive the class one drugs, anticoagulation, treatment of any triggering drug, like chest infection, optimize the heart failure therapies. And then according to its hemodynamic status, we either do rhythm or rate control, you all know that the beta bloggers, digoxin and anidarone are class 2A recommendation. If the patient improves, we will do just follow up. If he does not improve, we might try rhythm control by cath ablation or anidarone or cardioversion. If he improves, then we follow up. If he does not, we might do rate control by AV nodal ablation. The cath ablation for AF was upgraded in the 2021 guidelines. Uh, let me show you that the uh, recommendations for the treatment are that uh, class one to give anticoagulation for SHAD score uh, two or more in men and three in women, and a class 2A for, of score one in men and two in women. Direct oral anticoagulants are definitely class one recommendation in preference to vitamin K antagonists, except in patients with valvular, moderate to severe mitral stenosis or mechanical prothesis. The beta blocker and digoxin are class 2A for rate control. Beta blockers were downgraded. AF cath ablation in case of clear association between the paroxysmal or persistent AF that the patient has and worsening of heart failure symptoms, which persists despite medical therapy. Cath ablation is a class 2A recommendation for the prevention or treatment of AF. It was upgraded. What about the chronic coronary syndrome in heart failure patients? The patient will already be on beta blocker as a class one for heart failure. If he's still symptomatic and tachycardic in sinethrism, he should receive evabradine as a class 2A. If he is not indicated for evabradine, either heart rate less than 70 or he is AF, he should receive one of the class 2B drugs like trimetazidine, nitrates, amlodipine. Of course, the diltiazem and verapamil are contraindicated because this is a heart failure patient. The recommendations for revascularization in half ref uh, is the cabbage is class 2A uh, in patients suitable for surgery, especially if they have diabetes. PCR is considered as an alternative to cabbage as a class 2B. And coronary revascularization in general was downgraded uh, from class 1 to 2A. Uh, coronary revascularization should be considered to relieve persistent symptoms of angina in patients with half ref despite optimal medical therapy. It's a class 2A in, LB, in LBAT candidates needing coronary revascularization to avoid cabbage. Recommendations for the treatment of diabetes, as we already mentioned, the sodium glucose immunotransporter inhibitors are strikingly important and beneficial. It's a class 1 to give them to type 2 diabetics at risk of cardiovascular events and type 2 diabetics with heart failure. What about iron deficiency and anemia? There are two separate entities. Anemia is hemoglobin less than 13 in men, less than 12 in women. Iron deficiency, as we mentioned, the cutoff values for ferritin. Uh, it is very common in heart failure, can occur independent of the anemia. Our preparation of choice is the IV ferric, ferric carboxymal toes. Oral iron is not recommended, and erythropoietin stimulating agents are not recommended for anemia and heart failure. These are the recommendations. 
Remember that it's a class one to periodically screen the heart failure patients for anemia and iron deficiency, and class 2A to give the ferric carboxymaltose, as we mentioned, for the cutoff values. Uh, with ejection fraction less than 45%, the data showed that it uh, improves the heart failure symptoms and exercise capacity, with ejection fraction less than 50% to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization. What about heart failure and cancer patients? Uh, so the common scenario, many of our younger colleagues get consultation from the Oncology Institute, what to do if the patient is going to start chemotherapy, specifically if he has heart failure. So the first step is that you should do baseline risk assessment for this patient, including clinical assessment, ECG, echo, and biomarkers, natriuretic peptides, and troponin. According to your baseline risk assessment, you classify this patient into low-risk patients and medium or high-risk patients. How do you classify the patients? This is a, uh, a score proposed by in collaboration of the ESC and the uh, International Cardio-Oncology Society, the HFA ICO score. So uh, you should, when you check the patient, you, you should check all these items. Some items automatically uh, uh, get the patient into the very high-risk entity, like if he has heart failure or cardiomyopathy or has prior trust to Zumab cardiotoxicity. Some items like MI, stable angina, severe valvular disease, impaired ejection fraction, and older age are associated with high risk, and the rest are medium risk. How do we interpret this score? The low risk patient does not have any risk factor or one medium. The medium risk patient has two to four points. The high risk patient has five or more points or any high risk factor. Like if the patient who is going to start chemotherapy has stable angina, then he is definitely a high risk patient. And the very high risk are any very high risk factor, the heart failure or prior trastuzumab cardiotoxicity. These are examples of the cancer therapy causing heart failure. It's a long list in the guidelines. I encourage you to review it. Now that we have classified the patient into low risk or medium and high risk patient, we proceed to the management. The management is that we should do surveillance. In the low-risk patient, we do standard surveillance, which is at three months, and then assess the patient at 12 months, and then assess the patient every five years. If he's a medium and high-risk patient, we assess, we assess the patient in the first month after the first week of chemotherapy, then at three months, then at 12 months, then every five years. Every five years, surveillance includes history, examination, natriuretic peptides, troponin, and echo. Troponin is specifically important because uh, one of the cancer therapy causing heart failure, the immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors, is commonly associated with myocarditis. These are the recommendations for the management of cancer with heart failure. It's a class one to do the baseline cardiovascular risk evaluation, which we have mentioned. Better off if we do it with the HFA ICO score. It's a class 2A recommendation to give ACE and beta blocker in patients developing LV systolic dysfunction, defined as 10% or more decrease in ejection fraction to a value lower than 50% during anthracycline chemotherapy. And you will give a some beta blocker during anthracycline chemotherapy if the patient has a 10% decrease in ejection fraction, or if the ejection fraction drops to below 50% from baseline. I just mentioned quickly the acute myocarditis. We have viral causes, and of course we have the SARS-CoV-2, we have autoimmune causes like the sarcoidosis, giant cell myocarditis. We have medications like the immune checkpoint inhibitors, which we have just mentioned. Toxins like alcohol, amphetamines, cocaine. These were the recommendations for the follow-up and treatment of acute myocarditis. Uh, heart failure therapy should be started if the LV systolic dysfunction is present and should be continued for at least six months upon complete functional recovery which means that the patient recovered and his ejection fraction recovered and became in the category of heart failure improved ejection fraction. And yet we complete the optimal medical therapy for at least six months. Immunosuppression for six to 12 months is required only if there is a clinical or endomyocardial biopsy evidence of autoimmune disease and is not advised on routine basis in acute myocarditis. Intense sporting activities should be avoided uh, at least six months uh, after complete recovery. And you should follow up the acute myocarditis patient every year for at least four years. I'll just mention a, small, um, a few points about the SARS-CoV-2. 
um, this diagram is from the circulations published in 2021. It showed the, the cardiovascular effects of SARS-CoV-2. So Mary, we, Mary we, we need just only to cover the guidelines for the sake of time to allow more discussion. So I think this uh, we can okay. postpone these slides, okay? Okay, so it was my last slide. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amiri. Excellent presentation. As usual, uh, you covered everything related to the new guidelines in details. Uh, everything you uh, you mentioned, uh, from starting from diagnosis up to management of uh, different presentations, heart failure, comorbidities, uh, etc. Yes. So uh, I have some comments or uh, and questions uh, for Dr. Amiri. The universal definition is not only an American definition. It is American, European, and Japanese. The universal definition is a collaboration between Heart Failure Society of America, European Heart Failure Association, and Japanese Society of Cardiology. So it's, only, it's not only an American, okay? Okay. Uh, okay. The uh, second point, uh, a screening for iron deficiency now is uh, considered a class 1A. So any patients presenting with heart failure should be screened for iron deficiency. If this is yes. correct, uh, yeah. Uh, because, it, it, yeah. Any patients with heart failure should be periodically screened for uh, anemia as a class one recommendation. Yeah. Uh, which drug to start with? This is a very uh, important uh, question that's usually addressed. We have the four pillars, fantastic four. Which drug to start with? Yuri, you have four drugs, four groups. Can you explain for the uh, young colleagues when seeing patient uh, with the recently diagnosed with heart failure in the outpatient clinic, which drugs to start with? Uh, well, I, I was trying to search for, for this answer uh, in, uh, specifically. Uh, the American guidelines uh, said that uh, the patient, we can start with either beta blocker or ACE or ARNI. We can start with either one of them or both of them if the blood pressure and the general condition of the patient tolerates. Uh, generally, the beta blockers are well tolerated if the patient is more on the dry side and ACE or beta blockers if the patient is more on the congested side. After we start the ACE or ARNI and the beta blockers, uh, we move on to the, the mineralocorticoid antagonists. I think from how I, how I reviewed the literature, the uh, uh, impagliflozin or dapagliflozin uh, should be started from the beginning, as long as there are no contraindications. You remember that we published in the European Heart Failure Association uh, paper three months ago or more about patient profiles for uh, uh, before prescribing heart failure treatment. Patient profile uh, based on heart rate, uh, blood pressure, CKD, uh, uh, serum potassium, uh, sinus rhythm or atrial fibrillation. So uh, you have to consider the patient profile before uh, uh, to identify which drug to start with. So for example, patient with bradycardia cannot be given beta blocker. Uh, patients who have uh, a very low uh, creatinine clearance cannot start uh, uh, ACE or sacrobitrifalcertan. So patient profile is very important. And as you mentioned, the assessment of congestion first, if the patient is congested, so diuretics to relieve congestion, and there is no rule for beta blocker at this stage, and you can start with uh, SGL2 inhibitor from day one, as long as the GFR is at least 30, and yes. uh, sacrobitry, valsartan, or acinib. Regarding uh, naive patients, are you recommending uh, to start with sacrobitry, valsartan, better than ACE inhibitor for naive patients? And what is the uh, recent uh, I, guidelines recommendation? Uh, the European guidelines said that we can start with either ACE or sacrobitry, valsartan either one of them. The American guidelines put uh, sacubitril valsartan in preference over ACE. They, should, they should start with sacubitril valsartan. If it's not available or contraindicated or not tolerated, then we uh, go down to ACE. Uh, 
Uh, the European guidelines, uh, circuitry valsartan class 1B for patients uh, who are receiving S inhibitor to replace S inhibitor in symptomatic patients, okay? Yes. For, for naive patients, it's class 2B recommendation. Uh, it's class 2B to start yeah. in naive patients? Okay. Okay. Uh, yes. What about angiotensin receptor blockers? In the guidelines, um, yani, and uh, half ref, of course, half ref. Yani, while I was reading, I felt it was uh, rather uh, in these guidelines downgraded. Like it's um, we do not use either ACE or ARBS or ARNI. Uh, we use ACE or ARNI, and uh, um, and as you said, of course, doctor. And if the ACE is not tolerated, then we go down to uh, angiotensin receptor blockers. It's no longer um, uh, from the first choice from the beginning. Yeah, it's, but it's only class 1B in patients who cannot tolerate both uh, ACE or uh, ARN. Yes, okay. What about mildly reduced ejection fraction? Thank you. Mildly reduced, it's a class 2B. It's a class, class 2B. 2B. Yes. yes. You mentioned that SGL2 inhibitors can be given for diabetic uh, type 1, but uh, we cannot recommend this because DHF and the impro reduce the exclusion criteria, type one diabetes. Uh, yes, uh, but I found in the supplementary uh, data of the European guidelines, they said that it's um, it's uh, it's you can start it in type one, but you can start it very cautiously and know that there is a risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. But it's not studied definitely, as you say, professor. So um, it's not advisable. Yes, we cannot recommend because. Uh, Young colleagues should know that we are not giving uh, to any of them type one. Yeah, so it's contraindicated in type one. Yeah. So, uh, any questions from the uh, attendees who are joining us in this interesting session? That lines very important for the Sorry. primary to cover everything. Thank you. ماك دي ازيك؟ اهلا اهلا شام ازيك عامل ايه؟ انت عارف انا بحب دايما ادخل معاك كده ثلاث دقائق ولا حاجه ده احنا بنتشرف طبعا وبنسعد الله يخليك استميليت انا للاسف السيشن كلها حضرت حته صغيره كده وانا في العربيه بس اتس ا نايس وان بس انا عايز اسالك حاجه هو مش في الجايد لاينز اليوروبيان الجديده هم حطوا اس انهبيتور اور ارني نبتدي ده او ده والامريكان هم اللي حاطين ان بريفرنس الارني طبعا الليفل اوف ايفيدنس يوجوالي از ا بيت لوور مع الارني وحاطينها كلاس 1 ليفل اوف ايفيدنس بي ولكن هم حاطينهم الاثنين تو ستارت ذس اور ذات على عكس الجايد لاينز القديمه ما كانتش كده انت رايك ايه يا مجدي في القصه دي؟ uh... Well, this is a debatable uh, issue. Usually, uh, uh, usually we are starting with ACE inhibitor, and uh, patients who are still symptomatic, uh, we have to replace it with uh, with ARNI. And this is, as you mentioned, it's class one B in the guidelines. It's very yeah. clear. In naive patients, uh, I think uh, the guidelines uh, are in. Um, favor both, but for ARNI specifically, it's considered a class 2B recommendation from the start. But- uh, yeah, In American, they have a class 1, and they are actually, uh, they have upgraded, and they have it above the native PDB, unless there is a contraindication to its use. And I have a question to Mary. You are going to show the slides. Do you notice there is any wrong in the slides? بتاعت الهارت فيلير الاوروبيه ولا لا؟ آه كان في سايد فيها غلط فعلا في الهيف ريف في الاول حتى انا يعني عملت سكرين شوت من الجايد لاينز نفسها مش من السايد كان في غلط في الكلاسز اوف ريكومنديشن برافو عليكي هو فعلا في كان في غلط في الكلاس اوف ريكومنديشن والسلايد محطوط غلط شاطر برافو مجدي يعني ميرسي جدا انا مضطر اسيبكم اوكي يا شام احنا سعدنا بوجودك معانا طبعا الله يخليك الله يخليك ماشي يا مجدي اوكي شكرا شكرا مع السلامه مع السلامه
دكتور اميري طبعا يعني بنشكرك وانا لولا ان انا عندي بورد ميتنج هبتدي حالا دلوقتي within 10 minutes maximum so I have to leave لو في اي اسئله للدكتور اميري يعني you are welcome دكتور مجدي السلام عليكم ازيك يا مجدي ازيك يا مجدي العيانين اللي عندهم انيميا دول شود بي كوريكتد طب ايه الافيلبل دراجز لينا دلوقتي عشان نكوريكت الانيميا العيانين دول اذا كان الاورال تريتمنت از نوت ريكومندد البيوتين ار نوت ريكومندد طب وات وي كان دو؟ انت بتعمل ايه في العيانين؟ Um, the guidelines that we should, the preparation of choice, how well IV ferric or proximal tools, how well studied uh, with proven benefits to decrease the symptoms with hospitalizations or morbidity, uh, the IV ferric or proximal tools. احنا اللي افيلبل عندنا يا دكتور عصام هو الايرن ساكوز اللي هو اسمه الفيروساك. الفيروساك الفيروساك ده 100 ملي جرام من الامبول. بنحسب ايكويشن كده اسمها جانسوني ايكويشن للكوركشن اللي هي 2.4 في البادي ويت في 15 ماينس البيشنت هيموجلوم ليفل بندي تو امبولز اوفر يعني uh, على 100 سي سي نورمال سلاين كده اوفر هاف ان اور فيري طبعا كوشسلي في الاول تو تيست فور الرجي ده انفيوجن طبعا وبيتاخد افري اذر داي تل الكوركشن اوف ذا فيست عندنا الدكتور احمد كمال كان عمل رساله على الارن فاشنز في الهارت فيلير وهو الحقيقه عنده جود اكسبيرينس فاني بيشنت الحقيقه انا كل عيان الهارت فيلير بيشنز بعمل سكريننج للارن فاشنسي واي عيان فولفيلنج الكرايتيريا فور ايرن ثيرابي ببعته للمانيا للتخصص الدور الرابع بياخد الايرن اوفر يعني فيو اورز ويروح عادي وبعد كده يا اما بيجي ياخده بقى افري اذر دي يا اما بياخده في مكان قريب منه بعد ما بنكتب له الريكومنديشنز وازاي ياخد الايرن ثيرابي فاحنا عندنا اوريدي الايرن ساكروز ده والحقيقه اتس وان اوف ذا يعني تريتمنت اوبشنز في العين الحرفيه اللي بيحسن فعلا السيمتومز كواليتي اوف لايف وبيقلل الهوسبيتاليزيشن اند اي هاف سين ماني ماني بيشنتس Uh, with iron deficiency, and they are doing well uh, when are treated with uh, intravenous iron. Arwan, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. الله يخليك دكتور عصام شكرا دكتور امير شكرا دكتور مينا على المجهود الكبير اللي بي... بيقوم بيه الدكتور مينا شكرا دكتور امير شكرا لحضرتك دكتور مجدي شكرا على خير جميعا ان شاء الله مع السلامه مع السلامه عليكم